Hello, my darling friends. I'm going to just uh, adjust this a little so that I'm not just a talking head. That's a little better, maybe. Anyway, hello, and welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, you can't see it because I, I'm sort of uh, closed captioned here, but my friend Debbie Nieto uh, made me some lovely gifts, and I wanted to kind of brag on my friend a little bit. So I'm wearing this on my lapel. You can't, it's backwards for you, I think. But I, I wear this, she made this for my, for my pocket or my lapel. Oh, is it the other way around? Yes. Oh, okay. So, so it has my initials on it right there like that. And um, she made it for me. I'm really excited to have it. I love it very, very much. What a, what a beautiful, sweet, and thoughtful gift. I am so honored. Uh, also, we have a new video coming out. Um, hello, hello. We have a new video coming out tomorrow. And uh, I'm really excited because I'm adding a little bit of music, a little bit of sound, a little bit of different things to this wonderful um, puppet show that I do, My Friend the Devil. Uh, so very excited about that. What else do we have going on? Um, oh, uh, Justin Perry says, good evening, cannot wait, my friend, I look forward. This is one of my favorite stories. For those of you who have not joined me, it's all up on YouTube, so you can go back and listen. If you want to jump in now, you can go back and listen to the other ones. But uh, I'm reading The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. This is a very old copy. This is, this is uh, I believe it was 18, 1890s. The original story was written in the 1790s. So it entails the, the journey of Baron Munchausen. And uh, he, was, he was wild eccentric who told these extravagant tales. And it, it was so fantastic, utterly fantastic. In fact, however, it was based off of a real German Baron, uh, Baron Munchausen. And he did tell tall tales at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century. And uh, he, 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 in, in real life, he, he talked about going to the moon. And of course, the people at court just laughed and went, really? He went to the moon? Okay. But Munchausen, uh, the name Munchausen, was attributed to, it was given, the, the, there was a, a syndrome that was given the name of Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy. And this is, of course, where parents usually, or a loved one, will harm their friends, their family, their children, their parents. They'll harm someone close to them because it gets them attention. So they'll tell these tall tales of, oh, they fell down the stairs, or oh, they just suddenly have this rare disease. Oh, pity me, look at me. So, you know, that's a little history on the Baron. Uh, goodness, I don't even know where we left off. You have a question. I have a question, I don't see it. What is the question? Uh, Justin Perry says the 1890s editions have some of the best covers. Is yours the leather-bound edition? No, mine is unfortunately not a leather-bound edition. I'll show you. It is, um, it's this beautiful cloth-bound one, but it's, it's, it's very fragile. It's, it's so very fragile. It says, uh, Ar this is the Arlington edition, and it, it is, uh, it has... Clyde Dubbs, written in pencil, October 4th, 1899. And as you see, it's so fragile. The pages are coming undone. It's just, it's so fragile. But I love this book so very much. I, I, I read it once before to my Facebook Live. This was long before I was really focusing on my YouTube channel. Oh, another gift that my friend Debbie gave me is this beautiful bookmark. Isn't it lovely? You can kind of see the... Isn't that lovely? So yes, uh, I love this copy. I love this book. Oh, I should, I should prepare myself. I should prepare you so we can get in the mood of pretend and we can get into the mood of the Baron. We have to sort of, we have to sort of set the stage. I think it suits me. Maybe, maybe not. It's a little messy, but that's okay. is a little messy. Oh goodness, well, at any rate, you get the picture. Yes, we see. 
Chapter 18. My first visit to England was about the beginning of the present king's reign. I had on occasion to go down to Wapping to see some goods shipped, which I was sending to some friends at Hamburg. After that business was over, I took the Tower Wharf and my way back. Here I found the sun very powerful, and I was so much uh, intrigued. Boy, the, some, of, some of the words, my, my friends, are um, very hard to read. They're, they're, they're sort of, uh, the ink is fading on some of them, so I have to sort of figure out what it's trying to say. Uh, also, maybe because I'm really, really old. I'm not that old. Anyway, uh, here I found the, the sun so powerful, and I was so much intrigued that I stepped into one of the cannon to compose, to compose me when I fell asleep. There was about noon, it was the 4th of June, exactly at one o'clock. These cannon were all discharged in memory of the day. They had all been charged that morning, and having no suspicion of my situation, I was shot over the houses on the opposite side of the river in the farmer's yard. Between Bermondsey and Deptford, there I fell upon a large haystack without waking and continued there in a sound sleep till hay became so extravagantly dear, which was about three months after, that the farmer found it in his interest to send his whole stock to market. The stack I was reposing upon was the largest in the yard, containing above 500 load. They began to cut the first. I walked the voices of the people and had ascended the lad ladders to begin at the top and got up, totally ignorant of my present situation. In attempting to run away, I fell upon the farmer to whom the hay belonged, and broke his neck, yet received no injury myself. I afterwards found to my great consultation that this fellow was a most detestable character, always keeping the produce of his grounds for extravagant markets. Oh, that was a very short. Am I missing a chapter? Oh, that was chapter 19. That was chapter 19. I thought it was, I misread. <laughs> okay, chapter 19. Well, that was fun. Here's the little lithograph in the book you see here. Lovely etchings. Well, come now. I just had the page turned. It's a very old book and the pages sometimes like to stick. Chapter the 20th. Mr. Drybones travels to Sicily, which I had read with great pleasure, induced me to pay a visit to Mount Etna, my voyage to this place was not attended with any circumstances worth relating. One morning early, three or four days after my arrival, I set forth from a cottage where I had slept within six miles of the foot of the mountain, determined to explore the international parts if I perished in the attempt. After three hours' hard labour, I found myself at the top. It was then and had been for upwards of three weeks, raging its appearance in his state has been so frequently noticed by different travellers, that I will not tire you with descriptions of objects you already are acquainted with. I walked round the edge of the, of the crater, which appeared to be 50 times at least as capacious as the Devil's Punch Bowl near Petersfield in Portsmouth Road but not so broad at the bottom, as in that part resembles the contracted part of the funnel more than a punch bowl. At last, having made up my mind, in I sprang feet foremost. I soon found myself in a warm berth, and my body bruised and burned in various parts by the red-hot cinders which, by their violent ascent, opposed my descent.
However, my weight soon brought me to the bottom, where I found myself in the midst of noise and clamour, mixed with the most horrid imprecations. After recovering my senses and feeling a reduction of my pain, I began to look about me. Guess, gentlemen, my astonishment when I found myself in the company of Vulcan and his Cyclops, who had been quarrelling for the three weeks before mentioned about the observation of good order and due subordination and which had occasioned such alarms for that space of time in the world above. However, my arrival restored peace to the whole society, and Vulcan himself did me the honour of applying plasters to my wounds, which healed them immediately. He also placed refreshing refreshments before me, particularly nectar and other rich wines, such as the gods and goddesses only aspire to. After this repast was over, Vulcan ordered Venus to show me every indulgence which my situation required. To describe the apartment and the couch on which I reposed, it totally impossible is totally impossible. Therefore, I will not attempt it. Let it suffice to say it exceeds the power of language to do it justice, or speak of that kind-hearted goddess in any terms equal to her merit. Vulcan gave me a very concise account of Mount Etna. He said it was nothing more than a, an accumulation of ashes thrown from his forge that he was frequently obliged to chastise his people, at whom, in his passion, he made it the practice to throw red-hot coals at home, which they often par parted, par parried with great dexterity and then threw them up into the world to place them out of his reach, for they never attempted to assault him in return. By throwing them back again, our quarrels, added he, last sometimes three or four months, and these appearances of coals or cinders in the world are what I find you mortals call eruptions. Mount Vesuvius, he assured me, was another of his shops, to which he had a passage three hundred and fifty leagues under the bed of the sea. Where similar quarrels produce similar eruptions, I should have continued here as a humble attendant upon Madame Venus, but some busy tattlers who delight in mischief whispered a tale in Vulcan's ear, which roused in him a fit of jealousy, not to be appeased. Without the least previous notice, he took me one morning under his arm. As I was waiting upon Venus, agreeable to custom, and carried me to an apartment I had never been, I had never been, I had never before seen, in which there was all the appearance of a well with a wide mouth. Over this he held me at arm's length and saying, "Ungrateful mortal, return to the, return to the world from whence you came." without giving me the least opportunity of reply, dropped me in the centre. I found myself descending with an increasing rapidity till the horror of my mind deprived me of all the ref reflection. I suppose I fell into a trance, from which I was suddenly roused by plunging into a large body of water, illuminated by the rays of the sun. I could, from my infancy, swim well and play tricks in the water. I now found myself in paradise, considering the horrors of mind I had just seen, uh, I'd just been released from. After looking about me some time, I could discover nothing but an expanse of sea, extending beyond the eye in every direction. I also found it very cold, a different climate from Master Vulcan's shop. At last, I observed at some distance a body of amazing magnitude, like a huge rock approaching me. I soon discovered it to be a piece of floating ice. I swam round it till I found a place where I could ascend to the top, which I did, but not without some difficulty. Still, I was out of sight of land, and despair returned with double force. However, before night came on, I saw a sail which... Which uh, we appeared very fast. When it was within a very small distance, I hailed them in German. They answered in Dutch. 
I then flung myself into the sea, and they threw out a rope by which I was taken on board. I now inquired where we were, and was informed to the great southern ocean. This opened a discovery which removed all of my doubts and difficulties. It was now evident that I had passed from Mount Etna through the centre of the earth to the South Seas. This, gentlemen, was a much shorter cut than going around the world, and which no man has accomplished or ever attempted but myself. However, the next time I, I perform it, I will be much more particular in my observation. I took some refreshment and went to rest. The Dutch are very rude sort of people. I related the Etna passage to the officers exactly as I have done to you, and some of them, particularly the captain, seemed by his grimace and half-sentences to doubt my veracity. However, he had, as he had kindly taken me on board his vessel, and was then in the very act of administering to my necessities, I pocketed the affront. I now, in turn, began to inquire where they were bound, to which they answered they were in search of new discoveries, and if, said they, your story is true, a new passage is really discovered, and we shall not return disappointed. We were now exactly in Captain Cook's first track, and arrived the next morning in Botany Bay. This place I would by no means recommend to the English government as a res respectable receptacle for felons or place of punishment. It should rather be the reward of merit, nature having most bountifully bestowed her best gifts upon it. One moment. I'm assuming that's probably my very good neighbour, Mr. Johnny. One moment, my friends. Hello, Mr. Johnny. Hello there. Do come in. We are just reading the adventures of Baron Munchausen. Oh, are you, are you alive? Are you alive right now? We are live. They can hear you. Everybody say hello to my good friend, John Thompson. Hello, my friends. He's, How are you all? He's also the best mechanic that I have ever in my life ever had to deal with. And you know I deal with classic cars. He is the best. You can find him at Johnny on the Spot. I don't know. I, I, you could find him on, under John Thompson on, on the book of You can also find me at thegentlemanpsychic.com. You can find, you can <laughs> find him through, through me. The best mechanic. I, 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 my, a very good friend of mine, right? Thank you, sir, very much. It looks like he's brought a little bit of dinner for himself, so that yes, is yes, remarkable. I'm, I'm getting ready to go and lay myself down, and I, I would love to stay, but I'm going to go. I'm, I'm, we, 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 oh, you would, I'll tell you later <laughs> about what we went through, and you understand. I, you tell all my fans out there and your fans, I said hello. Well, they can hear you. Hello, fans out there. Would you like to actually say hello to them? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm, not even, I'm not even just for the occasion. That's <laughs> my hat at home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's all it's you know, I, while we're on this momentarily, mo momentary break, um, many of you know, of course, you watch my videos and you watch, you watch um, my friend the devil who sort of, he sort of looks like this and he kind of looks like this quite a bit. And um, so we're working on finding a, well, we have a puppet that is, is going to be altered for my very oh, yes. good friend. And uh, yes. so we're going to add that to the repertoire. We have we have an, uh, we have a witch that's come in. We've got oh many things. Yes. We've got we've got some we've got some. I've got a I've got a good a little friend over here. What we call um, Beelzebub. We call him oh, Bees for short. Bees, Mr. Bees. And what did you what did you call your friend? Uh, oh my God! Uh, um, oh Jesus! I'm I'm drawing a blank. Oh Jesus! I think is taken. Oh Jesus! I believe is taken. Okay. <laughs> just that I think I'll think about it and I'll let you know because he told he told me but I haven't talked to him in a couple of, I haven't talked to him in a couple of days to be oh that to was be. right to be continued to on be that continued, one yes. to be continued on that one yes well because we need the facts up yeah, we'll let Richard now read and we'll You go ahead and read, sir. I'm just going to find my movies, whatever we have. Yeah. Do what do what oh, you know, I'm doing with my good friend. I know where they are. Oh. Fans, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend the devil your ears. Trust me, he's not here to hurt you. <laughs> Love you guys. Okay? Love you to you, my friend. All right. All right, so you can grab some. 
I know I know where they are, and I just realized it. I just realized it. I forgot. I took them out of the bag. Um, and I think I put them in my truck. So I'm going to go find them. And I will see you guys later on, if not tomorrow. Brilliant. Okay. I look forward. All right. Good night. Good night. He is one of the sweetest persons. We're not breaking the rules. He actually lives up there. So we're not breaking the rules of quarantine. I just love that man. What a sweet and talented, brilliant mechanic. My goodness, the best I've ever dealt with. Anyway, my friends, thank you for your patience. We are back. Here we go. Um, administering to my necessities, I pocket the aff pocketed the affront. I now, in my turn, began to inquire where they were bound, to which they answered, and they were in search of new discoveries. And if, they said, your story is true, a new passage is really discovered, and we shall not return disappointed. We were now exactly in Captain Cook's first track, and arrived the next morning at Botany Bay. This place I would by no means recommend to the English government as a receptacle for felons, or place of punishment. It should rather be the reward of merit, nature having the most bountiful bestowed upon her gifts, uh, most bountifully uh, bestowed her best gifts upon it. We stayed here but three days. The fourth after our departure, a most dreadful storm arose, which in a few hours destroyed all of our sails, splintered our bow spirit, and brought down our topmast. It fell directly upon the box that enclosed our compass, which, with the compass, was broken to pieces. Every one who has been to sea knows the consequence of such a misfortune. We now were at a loss where to steer. At length, the storm abated, which was followed by a steady, brisk gale that carried us at least forty knots an hour for the six months. We should suppose the Baron has made a little mistake and substituted months for days. When we began to observe an amazing change in everything about us, our spirits became light. Our noses were regaled with the most aromatic effluvia imaginable. The sea had also changed its complexion and from green become white. Soon after these wonderful alterations, we saw land and not at any great distance in the inlet, which we sailed up near 60 leagues and found it wide and deep, flowing with milk of the most delicious taste. Here we landed and soon found it was an island considering of one of the large cheese. We discovered this, we discovered this by the company fainting away as soon as we landed. This man always had an aversion to cheese. When he recovered, he desired the cheese to be taken from under his feet. Upon examination, we found him perfectly right, for the whole island, as before observed, was nothing but cheese of immense magnitude. Upon th this, the inhabitants, who are amazingly numerous, principally sustain themselves, and it grows every night in proportion as it is consumed in the day. Here seem to be plenty of vines and bunches of large grapes, which upon being pressed yielded nothing but milk. We saw the inhabitants running races upon the surface of the milk. They were upright, comely figures, nine feet high, have three legs, and but one arm. Upon the whole, their form was graceful, and when they quarrel, they exercise a straight horn, which grows in adults from the centre of their foreheads with great adroitness. They did not sink at all, but ran and walked upon the sur surface of the milk as we do upon the, a bowling green. Upon this island of cheese grows a great plenty of corn, the ears of which produce loaves of bread ready made of round form like mushrooms. We discovered in our rambles over this cheese seventeen other rivers of milk and ten of wine. After thirty-eight days' journey, we arrived on the opposite side to that on which we had landed. Here we found some blue mould, as cheese-eaters call it, from whence spring all kinds of rich fruit. Instead of breeding mites, it produces peaches, nectarines, apricots, and a thousand delicious fruits. 
which we are not acquainted with. In these trees, which are of an amazing size, were plenty of birds, nests among others, was a kingfisher's of prodigious magnitude. It was at least twice the circumference of the dome of St. Paul's Church in London. Upon inspection, this nest was made of huge trees, curiously joined together. There were, let me see, for I make it a rule to always speak within a compass. There were upwards of 500 eggs in this nest, and each of them was a, as large as four common hogsheads, or eight barrels, and we could not only see, but hear the young ones chirping within. Having, with great fatigue, cut open one of these eggs, we let out a young one, unfeathered, considerably larger than twenty full-grown vultures, just as we had given this youngster his liberty. The old kingfisher lighted, and seizing our captain, who had been active in breaking the egg, in one of her hen, uh, one of her, uh, had been active in breaking the egg, in one of her hen claws, flew with him above a mile and then let him drop into the sea, but not till she had beaten all of his teeth out of his mouth with her wings. Dutchmen generally swim well. He soon joined us and retreated to our ship. On our return, we took a different route and observed many strange ob objects. We shot two wild oxen, each with one horn, and like the inhabitants, except that it sprouted from between their eyes of these animals. We were afterwards concerned at having destroyed them, as we found by inquiry they tame these creatures and use them as we do horses, to ride up upon and draw their carriages. Their flesh, we were informed, is excellent, but useless where people live upon cheese and milk. When we had reached within two days' journey of the ship, we observed three men hanging to a tall tree by their heels. Upon inquiring the cause of their punishment, I found they had all been travellers, and upon their return home had deceived their friends by describing places they never saw, and relating things that never happened. This gave me no concern, as I have never confined myself to facts. As I have ever confined myself to facts. As soon as we arrived at the ship, we unmoored and set sail from this extraordinary country, when, to our astonishment, all the trees upon shore, of which there were a great number very tall and very large, paid their respects to us twice, bowing to exact time, and immediately recovered their former posture, which was quite erect. By what we could learn of this, of this cheese, it was considerably larger than the continent of the of Europe. After sailing three months, we never, we knew not where being still without compass. We arrived in a sea which appeared to be almost black. Upon tasting it, we found it most excellent wine, and had great difficulty keeping the sailors from getting drunk with it. However, in a few hours, we found ourselves surrounded by whales and other animals of immense magnitude, one of which appeared to be too large for the eye to form a judgment of. We did not see him till we were, we were close to him. This monster drew our ship with all of her masts standing and sails bent by, by suction into his mouth between his teeth, which were much larger and taller than the mast of the first-rate man of war. After we had been in his mouth some time, he opened its he opened it pretty wide, took in an immense quantity of water, and floated our vessel, which was at least 500 tons burden, into his stomach. Here we lay as quiet as, as at anchor in a dead calm. The air, to be sure, was rather warm and quite offensive. We found anchors, cables, boats, and barges in abundance, and considerable number of ships, some laden, some not, which this creature had swallowed. Everything was transacted by torchlight, no sun, no moon, no planet, to make observations from. We were all generally afloat and aground twice a day. 
Whenever he drank, it became high water with us, and when he evacuated, we found ourselves aground. Upon a moderate computation, he took in some water at a single draught than is generally to be found in the Lake of Geneva, though that is above 30 miles in circumference. On the second day of our confinement in these regions of darkness, I ventured at low water, as we called it, when the ship was aground, to ramble with the captain and a few of the other officers with lights in our hands. We met with people of all nations to the amount of upwards of 10,000. They were going to hold a council how to recover their liberty, some of them having lived in the animal stomach several years now. There were several children here who had never seen the world, their mothers having lain in repeatedly in these warm situations. Just as the chairman was going to inform us of the business upon which we were assembled, this plaguy fish became thirsty, drank in his usual manner, the water poured in with such impetuous impetuosity that we were all obliged to retreat in our respective ships immediately, or run the risk of being drowned. Some were obliged to swim for it, and with difficulty saved their lives. In a few hours after, we were more fortunate we met again some just after the monster had evacuated. I, of course, was chosen chairman, and the first thing I did was to propose splicing two main masts together, and the next time he opened his mouth, to be ready to wedge them in as to prevent his shutting it. It was unanimously approved. One hundred stout men were chosen upon the service. We had scarcely got our masts properly prepared when the opportunity offered the monster, offered, the monster opened his mouth, Immediately, the top of the mast was placed against the roof, and the other pierced his tongue, which effectively prevented him from shutting his mouth. As soon as everything in his stomach was afloat, we manned a few boats. We rowed themselves, and who rowed themselves, and us into the world. The daylight after, as near as we could judge, three months' confinement and total darkness cheered our spirits surprisingly. When we had all taken our leave of the capacious animal, we mustered, we mustered just a fleet of 95 ships of all nations who had been in this confined situation. We left two masts in his mouth to prevent others from being confined in the same horrid gulf of darkness and filth. Our first object was to learn what part of the world we were in. This we were for some time at a loss to ascertain. At last I found from former observations that we were in the Caspian Sea, which washes part of the country of the Kalmuk Tartars. How we came here it was impossible to conceive, as the sea has no communication with any other. One of the inhabitants of the Cheese Island, whom I had brought with me, accounted for it, th for it thus that the monster in whose stomach we had been so long confined had carried us here through some subterraneous passage. However, we pushed to shore, and I was the first who landed. Just as I put my foot upon the ground, a large bear leapt upon me, and with his forepaws I caught one in each hand and squeezed him till he cried out most lustily. However, in this position, I held him till I starved him to death. You may laugh, gentlemen, but this was soon accomplished as I prevented him from licking his paws. From hence, I travelled up to St. Petersburg for a second time. Here an old friend gave me a most excellent pointer descended from the famous bitch before mentioned that littered while she was hunting in a hare. I had the misfortune to have him shot soon after by a blundering sportsman who fired at him instead of a covey of partridges which he had just set. Of this, of, of this creature's skin, I have had this waistcoat made, showing his waistcoat, which always leads me involuntarily to game. If I walk in the fields in the proper season, and when I come within shot, one of the buttons constantly flies off and lodges upon the spot where the sport is. 
and, as the birds rise, being always primed and cocked, I never miss them. Here are now but three buttons left. I shall have a new set sewed on against the shooting season commences. When a covey of partridges is disturbed in this manner, by the button falling against them, they always rise from the ground in the direct line before each other. I, one day, by forgetting to take my ramrod out of my gun, shot it straight through a, a leash as regularly as the cook had spitted them. I had forgot to put in any shot, and the rod had been made so hot with the powder that the birds were completely roasted by the time I reached home. Since I, my arrival in England, I have accomplished what I had very much at heart viz. providing for the inhabitant of Cheese Island, whom I had brought with me, my old friend Sir William Chambers, who is entirely indebted to me for all of his ideas of Chinese gardening, by a description of which he has gained such high reputation. I say, gentlemen, in a discourse which I had with this gentleman, he seemed much distressed for a contrivance to light the lamps of the new building's Somerset House. The common mode with ladders, he observed, was both dirty and inconvenient. My native of the Chinese island popped into my head. He was only nine feet high when I first brought him from his own country, but has now increased to ten and a half. I introduced him to Sir William, and he is appointed to that honourable office. He is also to carry under a large cloak, a utensil in each coat pocket instead of those for which Sir Williams has very properly fixed for private purposes. In so conspicuous a situation, the great quadrangle. He has also obtained from Mr. Purr, that's what it says, oh no, P-I-T-T, -T, from Mr. Pitt, the situation of messenger to His Majesty's Lords of the Bedchamber whose principal employment will now be divulging the secrets of the royal household to their worthy patron. Brilliant. I believe, my friends, we shall stop there for the evening. We are ending on... Oh, it's a supplement chapter. Maybe I can... Let's see how long this supplement chapter is. Oh, it's a small one. We'll read the supplement chapter. About the beginning of his present majesty's reign, I had some business with a distant relation who then lived on the Isle of Thanet. It was a family dispute and not likely to be finished soon. I made it, made it a practice during my residence there, the weather being fine to walk out every morning, after a few of these excursions, I observed an object upon great eminence about three miles distance. I extended my walk to to it, and found the ruins of an ancient temple. I approached it with admiration and astonishment. The traces of grandeur and magnificence which yet remained were evident proofs of its former splendor. Here I could not help lamenting the ravages and devastations of time, of which that once noble structure exhibited such melancholy proof. I walked round it several times, meditating on the fleeting and transitory nature of all the terrestrial things on the eastern end, where the remains of a lofty tower, near forty feet high, overgrown with ivy, the top appear apparently flat, I surveyed it on every side, very minutely, thinking that if I could gain its summit, I should enjoy the most delightful prospect of the circumstance circumjacent country. Animated with this hope, I resolved, if possible, to gain the summit which I at length effected by means of the ivy. Though not without great difficulty and danger, the top I found covered with a, this evergreen, except a large chasm in the middle. After I had surveyed with pleasing wonder the beauties of art and nature that conspired to enrich the, the scene, Curiosity prompted me to sound the opening in the middle in order to ascertain its depth. As I entertained a suspicion that it might probably communicate with some unexplored subterranean cavern in the hill, but having no line, I was at a loss how to proceed. 
After revolving the matter in my thoughts for some time, I resolved to drop a stone down and listen to the echo. Having found one that answered my purpose, I placed myself over the hole with one foot on each side, and stooping down to listen, I dropped the stone, which I had no sooner done than I heard a rustling below, and suddenly a monstrous eagle put up its head right opposite my face, and rising up with irresistible force carried me away, seated on its shoulders. I instantly grasped it around the neck, which was large enough to fill my arms, and its wings, when extended, were ten yards from one extremity to the other. As it rose with regular ascent, my seat was perfectly easy, and I enjoyed the prospect below with inexpressible pleasure. It hovered over Margaret for some time, was seen by several people, and many shots were fired at it. One ball hit the heel of my shoe, but did not did me no injury. It then directed its course to Dover Cliff, where it alighted, and I thought of dismounting, but was prevented by sudden discharge of musketry from a party of marines that were ex exercising on the beaches. The ball flew about my head and rattled on the feathers of the eagle like hailstones, yet I could not perceive it had received any injury. It instantly rescinded and flew over the sea towards Callias, but so very high that the channel seemed to be no broader than the Thames at London Bridge. In a quarter of an hour I found myself over thick wood in France, where the eagle descended very rapidly, which caused me to slip down to the back part of, the, of its head. By alighting on a large tree and raising its head, I recovered my seat as before, but saw no possibility of disengaging myself without the danger of being killed by the fall. So I determined to sit fast, thinking it would carry me to the Alps or some other high mountain where I could dismount without, without any danger. After resting a few minutes, it took a wing, flew several times around the wood, and screamed loud enough to be heard across the English Channel. In a few minutes, one of the same species arose out of the wood and flew directly towards us. It surveyed me with evident marks of displeasure and came very near me. After flying several times round, they both directed their course to the southwest. I soon observed that one I rode upon could not keep pace with the other, but inclined towards the earth, on account of my weight. Its companion, perceiving this, turned round and placed itself in such a position that the other could rest its head upon its rump. In this manner, in this manner they proceeded till noon, when I saw the rock of Gibraltar very distinctly. The day being clear, notwithstanding my degree of elevation, the earth's surface appeared just like a map, where land, sea, lakes, rivers, mountains, and the like were perfectly distinguishable. And having some knowledge of geography, I was at no loss to determine what part of the globe I was in. Whilst I was contemplating this wonderful prospect, a dreadful howling suddenly began all around me, and in a moment I was invested by thousands of small, black, deformed, frightful-looking creatures who pressed me on all sides in such a manner that I could neither move hand nor foot. But I had not been in their position for more than ten minutes, when I heard the most delightful music that can possibly be imagined, which was suddenly changed into a noise, the most awful and tremendous, to which the rapport of the cannon or the loudest clap claps of thunder could bear no more proportion than the gentle zephyrs of the evening of the most dreadful hurricane. But the shortness of its duration prevented all those fatal effects with prolongation of it would certainly have been attended with. The music commenced, and I saw a great number of the most beautiful little creatures seize the other party and throw them with great violence into something like a snuff-box, which they shut down and one threw it away with incredible velocity. Then, turning to me, he said, they whom he had secured were a party of devils, who had wandered from their proper habitation, and that the vehicle in which they were in enclosed would fly with 
unabating rapidity for 10,000 years, when it would burst of its own accord, and the devils would recover their liberty and facilities as at the present moment. He had no sooner finished his relation than the music ceased, and they all disappeared, leaving me in a state of mind bordering on the confines of despair. When I had recomposed myself a little, and looking before me with inexpressible pleasure, I observed that the eagles were preparing to flight on the, on the peak of Tenerife. They descended on the top of a rock, but seeing no possible means of escape, I dismounted. Determined me to remain where I was, the eagles sat down seemingly fatigued when the heat of the sun soon caused them both to fall asleep. Nor did I long resist its fascinating power in the cool of the evening when the sun had retired below the horizon. I was roused by, from my sleep by the eagle moving under me, and having stretched myself along his back, I sat up and resumed my travelling position. When they both took wing, and having placed themselves as before, directed their course to the South America, the moon shining bright during the whole night, I had a fine view of all of the islands of, in those seas. About the break of day, we reached the great continent of America, the part called Terra Firma, and descended on the top of a very high mountain. At this time, the moon, far distant in the west and obscured by dark clouds, but just afforded the light sufficient for me to discover a kind of shrubbery all around, bearing fruit something like cabbages, which the eagles began to feed on very eagerly. I endeavoured to discover my situation, but fogs and passing clouds involved me in the thickest darkness, and what rendered the sense, what rendered the scene still more shocking, was the tremendous howling of the wind of the wild beast, some of which appeared to be very near. However, I determined to keep my seat, imagining that the eagle would carry me away if any of them should make a hostile attempt. When daylight began to appear, I thought of examine the fruit which I had seen the eagles eat, and some was hanging which I could easily come at. I took out my knife and cut a slice, but how great was my surprise to see that it had all the appearance of a roast beef regularly mixed both fat and lean. I tasted it, and found it well-flavoured and delicious, then cut several large slices and put my put in my pocket, where I found a crust of bread which I had brought from Margaret, took it out and found three musket balls that had been lodged in it on Dover Cliff. I extracted them, and cutting a few slices more, made a hearty meal of bread and cold beef fruit. I then cut down two of the largest that grew near me, and tying them together with one of my garters, hung them over the eagle's neck for another occasion. Filling my pockets at the same time, while I was settling these affairs, I observed a large fruit like an inflated bladder, which I wished to try an experiment upon, and striking my knife into one of them, fine pure liquor, like Holland gin gushed out, which the eagles, observing eagerly, drank up from the ground. I cut down the bladder as fast as I could and saved about half a pint in the bottom of it, which I tasted and could not distinguish it from the best mountain wine. I drank it all and found myself greatly refreshed. By this time, the eagles began to stagger against the shrubs. I endeavoured to keep my seat, but was soon thrown to some distance among the bushes. In attempting to rise, I put my hand upon a large hedgehog which happened to lie among the grass upon its back. It instantly closed round my hand, so that I found it impossible to shake off. I struck it several times against the ground, without effect, but while I was thus employed, I heard a rustling among the shrubbery, and looking up, I saw a huge animal within three yards of me. I could make no defence, but held out both my hands, when it rushed upon me, and seized that on which the hedgehog was fixed. My hand being soon relieved, I ran to some distance, where I saw the creature suddenly drop down and expire with the hedgehog in its throat. 
When the danger was past, I went to view the eagles and found them lying on the grass fast asleep, being, of course, intoxicated with, it, with the liquor they had drank. Indeed, I found myself considerably elevated by it, and seeing everything quiet, I began to search for some more, which I soon found. And having cut down two large bladders, about a gallon each, I tied them together and hung them over the neck of the other eagle. And the two smaller ones I tied a cord around my own waist, having secured a good stock of provisions, and perceiving the eagles begin to recover, I again took my seat. In half an hour they arose majestically from the place without taking the least notice of their encumbrance. Each resumed its former station, and directing their course to the northward, they crossed the Gulf of Mexico, entered North America, and steered directly for the polar regions, which gave me the finest opportunity of viewing this vast continent that can possibly be imagined. Before we entered the frigid zone, the cold began to affect me, but piercing one of my bladders, I took a draught and found that it could make no impression on me afterwards. Passing over Hudson Bay, I saw several of the company's ships lying at anchor and many tribes of Indians marching with their furs to market. By this time, I was so reconciled to my seat and became such an expert rider that I could sit up and look around me. But in general, I lay, among the eagle, I lay along the eagle's neck, grasping it with my arms, with my hands immersed in its feathers in order to keep them warm. In these cold climates, I observed that the eagles flew with greater rapidity in order, I suppose, to keep their blood in circulation. In passing Baffin's Bay, I saw several large green landmen to the eastward, and many surprising mountains of ice in those, in those seas. While I was surveying these wonders of nature, it occurred to me that this was a good opportunity to discover the Northwest Passage, if any such thing existed and not only obtain the reward offered by the government, but the honour of a discovery, pregnant with so many advantages to every European nation. But while my thoughts were absorbed in this pleasing revere, I was alarmed by the first eagle striking its head against a solid, transparent substance, and in a moment that which I rode experienced the same fate, and both fell down seemingly dead. Here, our lives must inevitably have terminated, had not a sense of danger and the singularity of my situation inspired me with a degree of skill and dexterity which enabled us to fall near two miles perpendicular, with as little inconvenience as if we had been let down with a rope. For no sooner had did I perceive the eagle strike against a frozen cloud, which is very common near the poles, then they being close together, I laid myself along the back of the foremost and took hold of its wings to keep them extended at the same time, stretching out my legs behind to support the wings of the other. This had the desired effect, and we descended very safe on a mountain of ice, which I supposed to be without three miles above the level of the sea. I dismounted, unloaded the eagles, opened one of the bladders, and administered some of the liquor to each of them, without once considering that the horrors of destruction seem to have conspired against me. The roaring of the waves, crashing of ice, and the howling of the bears conspired to form a scene the most awful and tremendous, but notwithstanding this, my concern for the recovery of the eagles was, to, was so great that I was insensible of danger to which I was exposed. I thought this was much shorter. How many, how many pages does this one have? Oh, we only have one more page. Okay, we'll do that which I exposed. Having rendered them every assistance in my power, I stood over them in painful anxiety, fully sensible that it was only by means of them that I could possibly be delivered from these abodes of despair. But suddenly, a monstrous bear began to roar behind me, with a voice like thunder. I turned around, and seeing the creature just ready to devour me, having the bladder of liquor in my hands, through fear, I squeezed it so hard that it burst, and the liquor flying in the eyes of the animal totally deprived it of sight. It instantly turned from me and ran away in a state of distraction, and soon fell over a precipice of ice into the sea where I saw it no more. 
The danger being over, I again turned my attention to the eagles, whom I found in their fair way of recovery, and suspecting that they were faint for want of victuals. I took one of the beef fruits, cut it into small slices, and presented them with it, which they devoured with avidity. Having, having, giving, having, having given them plenty to eat and drink, and disposed of the remainder of my provision, I took possession of my seat as before. After composing myself and adjusting everything in the best manner, I began to eat and drink very heartily, and though the effects of the mountains, as I called it, was very cheerful, and began to sing a few verses for a song which I had learned when I was a boy. But the noise soon alarmed the eagles, who had been asleep, through the quantity of liquor which they had drank, and they arose seemingly much terrified. Happily for me, however, when I was feeling that feeding them, I had accidentally turned their heads towards the southeast, which course they pursued with rapid motion. In a few hours, I saw the Western Isles, and soon thereafter, the inexpressible pleasure of seeing old England. I took no notice of the seas or islands over which I had passed. The eagles descended gradually as they drew near the shore, intending, as I supposed, to alight one on one, one of the Welsh mountains. But when they came to the distance of about sixty yards, two guns were fired at them, loaded with balls, one of which took place in the bladder of liquor that hung to my waist. The other entered the breast of the foremost eagle who fell to the ground, while that which I rode, having received no injury, Flew, flew away with amazing swiftness. This circumstance alarmed me exceedingly, and I began to think that it was impossible for me to escape with my life. But recovering a little, I once more looked down upon the earth, when, to my inexpressible joy, I saw Margaret at the little distance, and the eagle descending on the old tower whence it had carried me on the morning of the day before. It no sooner came down than I threw myself off, happy to find that I was once more restored to the world. The eagle flew away in a few minutes, and I sat down to compose my fluttering spirits, which I did in a few hours. I soon paid a visit to my friends and related these adventures. Amazement stood in every countenance. Their congratulations on my returning in safety were repeated with an unaffected degree of pleasure. And we passed the evening as we are doing now, every person present paying the highest compliments to my courage and veracity. And that is where we leave you for the evening, my friends. Make certain to check out my Patreon. We've got so many things coming up. We have, um, I have a new video coming out for you tomorrow, so you'll want to see some of the behind the scenes from that. Um, I'll be working as soon as I'm done with here. I'll be working on another another story. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going to give it away. But I'll be filming that a little bit later on. Make certain you like and subscribe. I appreciate you all of you for joining me. Thank you so much. You mean so much to me. Till next time, my beautiful friends. Look at that hair. Anyway, thank you so much. Now let me see if I can figure out how to end this thing. I have to move the camera. Sorry. Here we go.